اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لیسن نمبر سیونٹی نائن سورت الانعام آیا ٹوینٹی ٹو تھرٹین الذین آتیناهم الكتاب دوز پیپل ٹو ہوم وی ہیو گیون دا سکرپچر یعریفونہ دے ریکگنائز اٹ اور دے ریکگنائز ہم کما یعریفون ابناءہم just as they recognize their own sons alladhina khasiru anfusahum fahum la yu'minun those who will lose themselves in the hereafter they will not believe who are alladhina atainahum alkitab they are the yahud and the nasara also known as the ahlul kitab and they were given the kitab meaning the scripture which is the torah as well as the Injil. So these people, what about them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that يَعْرِفُونَهُ They recognize him. Or they recognize it. Who? May be referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it may also be referring to the Qur'an. So they recognize him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَعْرِفُونَ is from the root letters عَيْنْ غَافَ From the word مَعْرِفَ or irfan. which is to recognize something by its signs. What does it mean? To recognize something by its signs. Like for example, there is a group of children and you are looking for your child. How will you find your child? You will look for the signs. Like for example, if he is wearing an orange shirt today, you look for orange. If you know he is the tallest kid in class, you will look for the head that is taking out. So, يَعْرِفُونَ is to recognize something by its signs. Over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these people, the Jews and the Christians, they recognize Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they recognize the Qur'an by the signs, which signs? The signs that they were informed of. They were informed of, by who? By their prophets. And they have been told about these signs, where? In the scripture. Which is why we learn that Salman al-Farisi, for example, he came to Medina. And when he saw that place, he stayed there because he knew that that was a place where the last messenger was going to come. He knew about the signs. Similarly, when he learned about the Prophet ﷺ, he went and met him and he offered some sadaqa. Why? In order to see if he would accept it. And then he gave him a gift in order to see if he would accept it. So what was all of this? The signs of the Prophet ﷺ. That they were informed of from before by their messengers, by their prophets, as well as they were detailed in their scripture. So they recognize him. Kama just as يَعْرِفُونَ abnaahum, As well as they recognize their own sons. Meaning this is how well they recognize the truthfulness of the Prophet ﷺ. They know so well that he is indeed the last messenger. There is no doubt about it in their hearts. Just as when a person sees his son, he knows that he is his son. When he sees the signs, he knows that he is his son. He doesn't have any doubt about it. He is 100% sure. Similarly, these people are 100% sure that Muhammad ﷺ is indeed the last messenger. But still they don't believe. Notice over here, what has been said is the way that they recognize their own sons. How come daughters have not been mentioned? For two reasons. First of all, because Muhammad ﷺ was a man. So they recognize him just as they would recognize their own son. If there's a group of people, they can spot their son very easily. Similarly, Muhammad ﷺ, they can recognize him as a messenger very easily. And secondly, Abna are mentioned why? Because generally, especially within the Arabs, they have an attachment to their sons more than they have with their daughters. So, كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ And also, if you think of it, daughters or girls generally, if they're in hijab, I mean, you can't really recognize them. If they're wearing proper hijab, unless if you know that they're wearing a bright pink hijab so you can spot them. The point of hijab is to hide the zina, to cover the zina, to not be too flashy. So, generally, if women are wearing the proper hijab, you won't be able to recognize your daughter if she is amongst many women. الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Those people who have lost themselves. 
فهم لا يؤمنون then they will not believe meaning those people who have put themselves to loss in the hereafter how by denying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are not going to believe why in order to gain some temporary benefit of this dunya and because of that they have sacrificed their akhirah they recognize him yet they don't accept him yet they don't believe in him why because they know that if they believe in him they're going to suffer in their dunya and as we know that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he was from the bani ismail that was the only reason why they didn't accept him because accepting him meant accepting someone else's supremacy over them and they weren't willing to give that up they had pride of their lineage of their family they didn't want an outsider fahum la yu'minun they're not going to believe now over here we see that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they recognize him and allah knows the state of their hearts isn't it so because we might wonder okay this is something that the quran is saying but do they really recognize him what evidence do we have what's the evidence that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and that is sufficient yes we do find evidences from their scriptures however the fact that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they recognize him this well that is sufficient for us because allah knows the reality of their hearts now why don't they accept him despite recognizing him because of the bias that they had against him because of the jealousy that they had against him and if you look at it if there is a person whom you don't like there is a person whom you cannot stand you cannot tolerate them you just don't like them you just don't get along with them even if they may be very good if they are praised in front of you will you praise them no if they are you know shown some favor if they are treated nicely in front of you are you going to treat them nicely as well no you're not going to why because of the jealousy in your heart because of the anger in your heart similarly these people despite the fact that they recognized him they acknowledged him but they wouldn't acknowledge by their tongue they wouldn't admit that yes he was indeed the messenger So what do we learn from this ayah? First of all we learn that upon seeing the truth, upon recognizing the truth, even if it goes against one's nafs, even if it goes against one's desires, a person should accept it. You know one is that you say I know that this is the truth but I'm not able to do it right now. For example, someone did not know about hijab and they find out about hijab being mandatory for instance. Now, one is that they say, no, no, there is no hijab. And the other is that they say, yes, I know it is a part of our deen. However, I find it difficult to do it right now. And inshallah, I will do it. That's another approach, isn't it? One is that you see the truth, you recognize the truth, but you deny it outright. Why? Because you don't agree with it. You don't want to do it. It goes against your desires. And the other is that you realize your weakness. but you don't try to hide the truth you don't try to deny the truth because if a person denies the truth then this is something that is unacceptable so the first lesson is that upon seeing the truth upon recognizing the truth one should accept it even if it goes against his desires and if there is someone who has more knowledge than you who is better than you and he is better than you in anything whatsoever if the truth is coming from him then accept it because sometimes we get stuck in the person that oh because it's him who is saying this because it's she who is saying this i'm not going to take it even if what they're saying is something that is 100% correct sometimes we don't like a person but they may be saying something that's very good they may know about something that we don't know about there's still something to learn from them but what is our attitude just because they're saying it i'm not going to listen no keep your heart open to the truth don't be concerned about who is saying it be concerned about what they're saying secondly we learn from this ayat that a person who does not accept the truth upon recognizing it who does not believe in it then what is he doing 
he is putting himself in loss. Generally, what do we think? That if we don't accept it, if we don't acknowledge it, then we'll be successful, then we'll be fine. That's what we think. However, in reality, when a person is denying the truth, when a person is rejecting it, in fact, he is putting himself to loss. Thirdly, we also learn from this ayah that a person who doesn't believe, despite recognizing the truth, and he becomes stubborn upon it, he does not cause loss to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not cause loss to the person who is speaking the truth, who is telling him about the truth. In fact, he is causing loss to who? Himself. Because we think that if we don't say, if we don't agree with them, they're going to lose. I, for example, if somebody is giving us very good advice, if somebody is giving a lecture, and we don't like that person, we say, we're not going to go to the lecture, whoever they are. I don't like them, I can't stand them, I'm not going to go sit in their gathering. That's what we think. And we think that by not going over there, we're going to cause loss to them. Well, they're going to give their lecture, they're going to give their advice. And Allahu A'lam, they may get reward for it. They may benefit from it. But we are depriving ourselves. Remember that. We're not causing loss to the other, but in fact we're causing loss to ourselves. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا And who is more unjust than the one who invents about Allah a lie? أَوْ كَذَّبَ بِآيَاتِ Or he denies his verses. إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Indeed the wrongdoers, they will not succeed. مَنْ أَظْلَمُ Meaning, there is no one who is more unjust than this person. This is the height of injustice. This is the greatest injustice. The one who iftara ala Allahi kadiban, who fabricates a lie against Allah. What is kadib? Kadib is falsehood, lie, meaning that which is contrary to reality. And it's the opposite of sidq. It's not the opposite of haq. What's the opposite of haq? Batil. And kadib is the opposite of sidq. So kadib is that which is contrary to reality. And over here, fabricating a lie against Allah, what does it mean by that? First of all, by saying that Allah has a partner, or that Allah has a child, or that Allah has daughters, or that Allah has a spouse, na'udhu billah, this is what? A lie about Allah. This is a statement that is contrary to reality. He does not have any partner. He does not have a child. He does not have children. He does not have daughters. No. And if somebody says that, he is fabricating a lie because there is no evidence behind it. Secondly, if تَرَعَدَ اللَّهِ كَذِبًا It is to say that Allah has said something whereas He has not actually said it. So basically, it is to attribute a false statement to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, saying that something is halal, whereas actually it is haram. Or saying that something is haram, whereas actually it is halal. This is what? You're inventing something and you're attributing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many times if people want to justify what they're saying, if they want to prove what they're saying, what do they say? It's in the Qur'an. It's in the Qur'an. Don't you know about it? So, this is what? Fabricating a lie. Similarly, if a person invents a hukum, if a person invents a hukum, he just innovates a ruling in the deen. And he's saying this is from Allah. Then that is also attributing a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, if ala Allahi kathiban is to claim that a person receives revelation from Allah, whereas he does not receive any revelation from Allah. Because how is he attributing a lie to Allah? He's saying, whatever I'm saying is coming from Allah, whereas actually it's not coming from Allah. He's just saying it so that people would believe in him. So that he becomes a leader. And in order to do that, 
he's making up stuff and he's attributing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person who does that, he is someone who is the most unjust person. Aw or kadhaba bi ayatihi. Or he belied his ayat. What does kadhaba mean? Kadhaba is to declare something as a kadhib, as a lie. Like saddaqa is to confirm the truthfulness of something. Kadhaba is to declare something as a lie. Saddaqa is to declare something as sidq. And kadhaba is to declare something as a kadhib. So, aw kadhaba bi ayatihi, or he belied his ayat, his verses. Which ayat? All those ayat that prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is haqq. Whether those ayat are kawni, or they are shari. So for example, takhdeeb of ayat kawni is, for instance, a person says that Allah did not create the universe. Allah did not create the sun, Allah did not create me, Allah did not create you. No. This is what? Kathaba bi ayati. Denying, rejecting the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayat kawni. And ayat shari. For example, a person says, Allah never sent down any scripture. Allah never sent down any Quran. Allah never gave this hukum. Allah never revealed the surah. Allah never sent a messenger. This is what? Kathaba bi ayati. Denying the ayat of Allah. Innahu la yuflihu zalimun. Indeed, the wrongdoers, they do not succeed. What is yuflihu? It is from falah. And what is falah? To be successful. It is to attain the purpose, the goal. And it is to be saved from that which is disliked. So basically, falah is, it is composed of two things. First of all, to attain the matloob. What is matloob? That which a person desires, that which a person wants. The goal. And secondly, it is to be saved from the makruh. Meaning that which a person is trying to stay away from, that which he dislikes, he is actually saved from it. And if a person only gets the matloob, but at the same time he is afflicted by the makruh, then is that falah? No. And if a person is saved from the makruh, but he does not get the matloob, is that falah? No. It's both of them together. That is what true falah is. You know, some people say, oh, it doesn't matter on the Day of Judgment. Even if a person has to go through hellfire, eventually he's going to Jannah, it's okay. That is not true falah. What is falah? What is falah? That a person is saved from the hellfire and then he enters into Jannah as well. That is what falah is. So, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Those who do zulm, they can never be successful. What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, we learn that zulm is of various levels and it is of various types. There is zulm, injustice that is done against oneself, that is done against other people, that is done against Allah's Messenger. And there is also that zulm that is done against who? Against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like for example, shirk. Or for example, attributing a lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or for example, denying the ayat of Allah. This is what? Zulm against who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So zulm is of various types and it's also of various levels. Where do we learn that from? That it's of various levels? From this ayah. From the word azlamu. Man azlamu. What does it mean? That this is the height of injustice. There are other injustices as well. But they are lesser in degree. But this one is the highest in degree. The most severe in its degree. Do you remember in Surah Al-Baqarah we learned, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ مَنَعْ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا إِسْمُهُ وَسَعَ فِي خَرَابِهَا That was also, that who is more unjust than such and such person, meaning this person is the most unjust. So when you put both of these ayats together, then who is more unjust? Was it that or was it this? And there are many other ayat in the Qur'an which say, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ So what does it mean by that? 
Remember that azlamiya, meaning the height of injustice, this is relative. This is all relative. In the sense that fabricating lies, it is zul. It is injustice. However, fabricating a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the height of injustice. Similarly, creating fasad is injustice. But creating fasad in the masjid, that is the height of injustice. So you understand? It is relative. Meaning you don't put the different ayats together and you say, okay, is this a greater crime or is this a greater crime? Both are great crimes. But they are defined as most unjust. Why? Because they are most unjust with regards to that crime. Because lying against anyone is very wrong. But lying against Allah is absolutely wrong. It's the height of injustice. Secondly, we also learn from this ayah that sins and crimes, they are also of various types and of various levels. Not just injustice, but other sins as well. There are some sins that are lesser in degree, some sins that are higher in degree, which is why we have minor sins and major sins. We also learn from this ayat about warning, severe warning against what? Lying against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and denying the ayat of Allah. Severe warning. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Those people who do zulm, they can never be successful. So what do we learn? About severe warning against lying against Allah and against denying the ayat of Allah. We also learn from this ayah that wrongdoers, those people who do zulm, they can never ever be successful. Never. But a person might say there are people who are so unjust, they are so cruel, but still they are successful in the sense that they attain their goals. They manage to do what they want to do. So what does it mean by this? That they are not successful. Remember that success is also of different types. One is absolute success, complete success, which is when a person is saved from the hellfire and he enters into Jannah. Or that a person is successful in every situation, in every instance, in everything that he does. This is what absolute success is. And another type of success is falah that is muqayyad. Meaning that which is fixed in time or place. In the sense that a person is successful in one situation, but he is not successful in another situation. A person may be successful at one point, but he is not successful in the next thing that he is doing. Or the next hour. And we see that it's possible that there is a person who is very unjust, who commits injustice against other people, against the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against the messenger, against the deen. And they may seem to be successful temporarily. However, at the end, they're not successful. At the end, all such people, all such people, they're not successful. If we look at it, all of the enemies against the Prophet ﷺ, and what happened to them? Were they successful? No. Eventually, they did not attain success. Similarly, over the history, if you see, all of these leaders who have been very harsh and very cruel towards people, for example, Fir'aun, Namrud, and after them as well, we see that at the end they weren't successful. They were very unjust to the people, but they weren't successful at the end. وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا And mention, O Prophet ﷺ, the day that we will gather them all together. Gather who? Who does them refer to? All people, all mankind. Whether they are those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or those who don't submit to Him. Whether they are those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they worship others than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether they are leaders or they are followers. Whether they are the unjust ones or they are the ones who are being oppressed. وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا All together, every single person is going to be gathered over there. And not even one person is going to be allowed to be absent. Every single person. ثُمَّ then, نَقُولُ We will say to who? 
للذين اشركوا to those people who did shirk in particular those people we will say to them اين شركاؤكم where are your partners الذين كنتم تزعمون those whom you used to assert those whom you used to claim as partners with Allah where are they how come they're not here to help you notice over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says summa that the day that we will gather them all together and then we will say to those people who did shirk this summa what does it show it shows a sequence of events and it also shows delay in time and there are many other usages of the word summa as well over here in particular it gives a sense of delay in time meaning summa then after a while after some time so we see that the questioning the hisab it will not take place as soon as people rise out of their graves it will not take place as soon as people rise out of their graves it will not happen immediately rather it will happen after some time what's going to happen is that upon rising from the graves people will gather in the plain of hashr and then they will wait until allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will begin the judgment until he will begin the hisab and this waiting period is going to be so long and it's going to be so difficult upon mankind that people will go to adam alayhi salam they will go to musa alayhi salam they will go to ibrahim alayhi salam isa alayhi salam all the major prophets and then eventually they will go to muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam and they will request each and every one of them that please request your lord to begin the hisab but each of the prophets will say no i cannot for example adam alayhi salam will say i am afraid because i ate of the fruit of jannah so each of the prophets they will say that no i cannot i am too afraid and muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam then he will fall into sajda into prostration allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow him to praise him in a way that no one has ever praised allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before and then eventually the hisab will begin i'm just paraphrasing this is just a gist of the hadith because the hadith in itself is extremely long I'm just summarizing it for you. So when the hisab will begin, then the mushrikeen will be questioned. Summa then meaning after some time, نَقُولُ لِلَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَيْنَ شُرَكَاءَكُمْ Those people who did shirk, we will ask them, where are your partners? Shuraka is a plural of shariq. And who is shariq? One who is given a share of something. So who are these shuraka those who were given a share of the exclusive rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by who by people So for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's exclusive right is that he alone should be worshiped So if a person worships another then what is he doing He is sharing another in the right of Allah This is what shirk is So where are your shuraka? Notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say over here shuraka e my partners those whom you associated with me but he says shuraka ukum your partners meaning those whom you thought you claimed were shuraka of mine. So he says shuraka ukum because those who according to you were worthy of worship you thought that they did everything for you you thought that they gave you provision they decided your fate they helped you they assisted you where are they today aina shuraka'ukum and notice shuraka plural is being used why because people worship various types of shuraka some have associated a partner with allah some have associated a son to allah some have associated a spouse to allah some say that the sun is the god some say that the moon or the stars or the mountains or the clouds i mean people have many many shuraka so aina shuraka'ukum where are all those shuraka whom you associated alladhina kuntum taz'umun whom you thought whom you claimed were my partners taz'umun is from the root letter zai ain mim and zam is to claim or to presume something about someone 
And generally it is used for a claim that is batil. That is completely false. That is completely false. And it's doubtful. Meaning even if a person does believe in it, he is still doubtful. So, الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ Whom you claim. Meaning you claimed that they were my partners. Or you claimed that they were going to intercede for you today. So how come they're not here today? How come they're not interceding for you? How come they're not helping you? Because in the dunya, why do people associate partners with Allah? For some people, the reason is that they think that on the day of judgment, when they need help, they will come and intercede for them. They will come and help them. That for example, in the dunya, a person prays to who? A dead man, a dead saint, a righteous person who died, and at his grave, a person will go and pray to him. This is what? Shirk. And he will pray to him thinking that if I pray to him today, if I can make him happy, then he will save me in the hereafter. Similarly, people go and sacrifice for their sake, that on the day of judgment, they will come and help me. Whereas, we learn that such shuraka will not come to help a person. Kuntum tazirmoon, you claimed that they were my partners. You claimed that they will come and help you. Where are they today? What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, there is severe warning against shirk, against associating partners with Allah. Whether it is in ibadah, in uluhiyah, or rububiyah, or in Allah's asma wa sifat, whether it is in worshipping Him, or it is in thinking that there is another creator, or there is another provider, or associating someone in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any type of shirk, any type of shirk, there is severe warning against it. Secondly, we also learn from this ayah that every person, every single individual will be brought to the hashr and none will be allowed to be absent. In the dunya, what happens? If there is a very important event, if there is a very important meeting and everybody is told, attendance is mandatory. For example, coming to school every day, class for you is mandatory. Attendance is mandatory. You don't have a choice. But what happens still? People, either they don't come, or they show up late, or they skip, or they will leave early. In the dunya, this is possible. But in the hereafter, it's not possible at all. Every single person will be present. Every single person will be forced to be there. Nobody can miss that gathering. Nobody can miss that meeting. And if we're not used to being regular and having regular attendance in this dunya, then imagine how difficult it will be for those people who are not regular with their attendance. That they will be forced to be there. How difficult it would be for them to stay there. We also learn from this ayah that a person who does shirk with Allah, he will not find those whom he associated with Allah on the Day of Judgment for his help. And this will be utter humiliation and loss for them. Utter humiliation. Just imagine if you have a friend and you make a plan with her that you know I'm going to such and such place and I will need your help when I call you. Make sure you pick up your phone. And imagine you're there and you call them and they don't pick up their phone. You're stuck. What will you do? You will be fearful. You will start panicking. And imagine if it's an extremely difficult situation. And they don't pick up the phone. So in the dunya, yes, you suffer loss. But somehow or the other, you can make up for it. Or you can get out of it. But in the hereafter, when a person was depending completely on those shuraka and they don't show up, imagine the fear. Imagine the panic. Imagine the humiliation. We learn in Surah Ghafir, Ayah 73 and 74, ثُمَّ قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ Then it will be said to them, where is that which you used to associate with him in worship other than Allah? And they will say, they have departed from us. We don't know where they are. They have abandoned us. They have left us. In Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 94, we learn, وَمَا نَرَى مَعَكُمْ شُفَعَاءَكُمُ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّهُمْ فِيكُمْ شُرَكَاءَ لَقَدْ تَقَطَّعْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَضَلَّ عَنْكُمْ مَا كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ And we do not see with you your intercessors, 
which you claimed that they were among you associates of Allah. It has all been severed between you and lost from you is what you used to claim. So the connection that you had with them, it's all severed. It's finished. And all that you claimed is gone from you, is lost from you. We also learn from this ayah that all those whom a person relies upon besides Allah, they are in reality unreliable. Anything and everyone whom you depend upon besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality is what? In reality is unreliable. For example, if you depend on your phone, can your phone die on you? Yes. If you depend on your computer, can your computer freeze? Yes. If you depend on your card, your bank card, is it possible that it may not work somewhere? Yes. If you depend on your car, can your tire puncture? Yes. Anything and everyone that a person depends upon, if a person thinks that if I have this, then I will be successful, then I will be saved, then in reality that thing is unreliable. At the end of the day, who should a person trust upon? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if a person is stuck there that no, this was a solution to my problems, will he be able to be content in his heart? No, he will stay miserable. We also learn from this ayah that shirk has no evidence. It is based on pure assumption and imagination because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ You used to claim, you used to assert. So shirk is based on pure assumption and imagination. It has no evidence whatsoever.